Welcome, my name is John Miller, and uh, you're, you're here for Minecraft projects, and it says Minecraft projects for every classroom. Uh, imagine taking a painting like this, Christopher Nevinson's uh, work of New York City, soul of the soulless city. And what these artists did was they imagined you, as a Minecraft player, being able to dive into the painting. And what kind of things would you experience? This is, it's about New York, so building up an environment about New York City in the 1920s, but using Minecraft to do it, and involving activities for students or for learners throughout the world. So here is a, a trailer. And by the way, Minecraft, if somebody were to uh, go to YouTube and Google Minecraft, look for Minecraft tags, and if you did that, you would see that there's about 175 million videos on YouTube that have Minecraft tags on them. Minecraft is like the second most searched for term, or the second most used tag in uh, YouTube. It's incredible, and who's making those videos? Our students, from five to 25 year olds, have made the majority of those. They want to share. Uh, and so there's a thriving Minecraft <laughs> community on YouTube, if you haven't seen that already. Kids playing Minecraft, and then they go to YouTube and watch other people playing Minecraft, and so they can go back. They want to teach, they want to learn, and they want to share what they know. So this is a uh, review of the first one, Soul of the Soulless City. While you're exploring the world, you're getting to interact with people in there. This is a, the most fun I've ever had on a roller coaster before. It goes in all the way through the city. There's guided activities there, so you're not just roaming wantonly. You get to uh, explore and play games and learn about New York in that time period and what the artist was thinking. For Minecraft players, that's a parkour course. So you, you have to jump from uh, steel girder to steel girder. Uh, these are the producers of it, and it's the result of the effort from like four people who really know what they're doing. Here's the second one they've published, the Pool of London, and they start with an image like that, and then it's just four folks inspired. What could we build inside of this that would reflect uh, the artistic heritage of the scene? So let's play. which shows off some more of the interactivity.
to help him mix paints to find the right colors he's looking for. Now, those two have already been released, and these are for Minecraft. Uh, I use in my class, and I think most of us who are using it at school use a version of Minecraft called Minecraft EDU. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about more of that later, but in regular Minecraft, the, all these are free to download, and you could be playing them like right now. I wouldn't download them right now, but you could actually get your kids on these playing if they have a Minecraft account. They could be playing these anytime. There's more coming up, though, because they have a contract for, I think, seven or nine of these worlds. And here's what's going to be released this year. And one of these is going to be released on Tuesday, a new world. And I, I see these, and I just kind of get, as a Minecraft player, but also as somebody that really enjoys art, I just get chills thinking of the possibilities of what will they create when we can dive into a picture like that or that. Or as a history teacher, <laughs> I salivate over the thought of that world being recreated. Installation? I'm not sure which one, but one of these will be released on Tuesday. And for us Minecraft EDU players, it, this runs on Minecraft 1.8 and we're at 1.7. So as soon as Minecraft EDU updates to 1.8, which I imagine will be before the next school year begins, you can have those worlds in your classroom for your kids to go through. Uh, and the download link and everything is there on my, my website for those. So I thought, oh gosh, inspiring, absolutely inspiring stuff. And it's Adam here is the lead artist on this and one of the originators of him. And you have to follow him like right now because honestly he's the most creative person in Minecraft there is. Uh, he's an artist himself. He's not necessarily a, a teacher. He doesn't work in a classroom, but he has an extraordinary mind for thinking of wonderfully creative, uh, immersive worlds and ideas to put ourselves in, but our kids in. He has a great series on YouTube that he shows off some of the Tate World things he's doing, but also for teachers. He has a series called 101 Ideas for Minecraft Learners, and I've gotten some great excuse me, great ideas in my class for that. So uh, Adam Clark with an E and at the common people. And he's very open, just like uh, Mr. Crippo there. He's very open. And if you tweet him, he'll tweet you back and ask questions. So I was inspired by that to think of something for uh, a project, a project idea, a deep project idea of starting out with a giant image like that, a visual. My students, we need visuals, right? We absolutely have to have visuals. And so I've, I found a couple images I thought would fit a time period. So this would be something for maybe an 11th grade history class or 11th grade students, not necessarily history, because I think this could be inspiring enough to turn into a, a PBL project. Uh, Picasso painting and then also music. Uh, we need more of both to get back in our schools and our kids to explore both of these. So if you start with one of those and let your imagination run with it, what kind of things could we uh, dive into here as a, as a, for a project-based learning? Uh, what made the Roaring Twenties roaring? Uh, what is the jazz age? And what are the characteristics of that? And if we let our students go, and discover some of these things, from jazz to influences at the time, the jazz performers, Gatsby, of course, the moral breakdown of civilization, and interestingly, the uh, thinking about being too modern and what it meant to be modern and what the future would be, and Art Deco and economics, building all of that into a PBL project around what is the, uh, the jazz age or what does it mean to be in the Roaring Twenties. Building in the community, because you want the kids to go out and research it. So have them send them out, interview artists, interview local historians, connect with museums, uh, automobile nuts, who will tell you all about the great cars in the, in the 20s, uh, local historians, musicians, and bring it back. And if you think high school kids, eh, they don't like Minecraft, you let them play Tate Worlds, and they'll do it all themselves. They will get so excited to be part of something like that. And building a world that you step into that includes all those features of it. 
So I, I, I love that idea, and I think it can be easily applied <laughs> by kids. Uh, maybe not so by us, but they're more comfortable with it, absolutely more comfortable with it, and they'll be challenged by it. And my next one here has to do with uh, literacy. Holes is a great book. And as a history teacher, my students, uh, I, I teach in uh, King City. So I have a lot of students that are, a lot of students that are two, three, four grade levels below in reading and in writing. So I can't just throw something out there that's, that's written at a seventh, eighth, ninth grade level. It just doesn't work. I have to modify it for my kids. And that's hard work. So I developed a model here that I think is, has worked for me to teach literacy with Minecraft. And it revolves around storytelling. We're all storytellers. Uh, we've been storytellers for the longest time. And my kids need to hear a story, but I want them to be able to see it, too. And so I came up with this idea of, let's go back in time. We're a history teacher. I'm that teacher, one of those history teachers that puts on costumes and runs around with swords and yelling and screaming at the kids and chasing them and stuff like that, because it's got to be immersive. I love the role play idea. And I, like a lot of us, learned history, learned some things from computers way back and playing Oregon Trail. I think I learned everything about the Oregon Trail from playing the game. And that enthusiasm has carried over. You know, you don't cross the river if it's too high, right? You're going to die. Watch out for dysentery. Uh, it's, it's funny how that connects with, and, and John was mentioning it too, and, and from the uh, I guess the speaker this morning, of the things we remember and how important they are in our lives. And somehow that sticks. So I wanted to give my kids an Oregon Trail experience, but I wanted to put them in it and not just be the third person. Uh, this is a, uh, an author that I absolutely love. If you haven't, haven't read anything by Ian Mortimer, uh, historian, but he writes for non-historians. And he's created a couple of series here about the Middle Ages. This is a great book, The Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England. He has a follow-up, The Time Traveler's Guide to uh, Elizabethan England as well. And he teaches, or he, he shares history in a very different way. It's, you're there. He guides you through it. So you're, you're a character, uh, and you're walking through his descriptions. You're living life as a medieval peasant. And I, I love that, his attitude about it, too. And that's kind of how I approach my class. I want them to get inside and experience history from the inside. Life was tough. That's what it was like. We, the movies we see, no, that doesn't do any justice to actual life in the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. And I want my kids to be able to see that. So I've developed this model. Uh, the teacher, here's what I've had to do. First, I contacted a friend of mine who's a, a writer. His name is Robert Walton. And I said, I need short vignettes because I need something my kids can get through in a, in a period. Having them read something over two or three days doesn't work. It just doesn't work for my guy. So I, I wanted something small, something 250, 350 words that we could get through. I asked for a narrative, and I wanted several of these. So they could, he could pick out bits and pieces for me of content that I wanted to get across during this time period of about 200 years. So we met, uh, we had a nice long, long, long lunch, and I, we mapped it out. And he created these nice short stories for me. Great dialogue. He's great at writing dialogue. Historical narratives. I then took his historical narratives and I visualized them in Minecraft. I created it. That scene that he wrote about, I created it. And they're not huge scenes. It didn't require a lot of expertise because they kind of took place in a village or in a room or in a very small setting. So it wasn't, didn't require too much of me. And then I added more details, though, to it. And I added characters to it that weren't in his original story to give different points of view. And I wanted the kids to see that from perspective. And the first unit we did was on the Dark Ages. So we focused on Vikings. What better way to tell the story than through Vikings? Now, the students, they get his read, or his reading, 
and they, we do a close reading activity all together so to make sure what everybody knows what it is. We, I turn it into an annotation exercise too, using Google Docs, where my kids work on it individually, we work on it together, and I can see what they're doing, and I can help out immediately the kids that need the help. So we're, we're getting the, I know they're learning the material here. Then I say it's time to go into Minecraft. Once I've seen that they've got the reading, they understand it, they dive into Minecraft, and they experience the scene they just read individually, and they're all running around, I'm hovering above, flying around, making sure everything's going great. In those first few times, I was uh, super nervous. I didn't know if it was gonna work, but it worked brilliantly. The kids did exactly what I had hoped they would do. They went and interviewed people. They did just go kind of in random locations, but I had things out there for them to discover in random locations. And then they recorded the details of this. In Minecraft, there's a book and a quill, so you, each student gets a book and a quill. And they bring up the book and the quill, and they can type in their story, their observations, what they're seeing. We're working on sense details, too, and descriptions in here. I really need to hammer that home with the guys. And there's Bob, and here's an example of one of his uh, narratives that just captures the kids. Uh, the first couple sentences, their round eyes are searching, searching. Thin rain glistens on helmets and axe blades. Long-handled axes made for chopping men. I shudder and look away. Now, every seventh grader is just enthralled at that point. I've got him, right? He is, a, he is so great at riding the hook. We, we taught together for many years, and I was very fortunate to uh, be able to work with him. So it, it goes on, and as you can read a little bit more there, and the, the resources are on the site if you want to see them all. So this is from Brother Michael. This is his observation of the Viking raid at Lindisfarne, the very first one in Europe. And the Vikings are, he ran away, but he's got a, a holy relic with him. So the, he's going to be hunted now by the Vikings. Here's what I do with it, and this is part of a cutout of my annotation exercise. I've, I want the kids to put their answers in a very specific place to help me grade it. I want them to do uh, highlights with yellow and green highlighters, a couple of things, different color highlighters. So I'm really glancing quickly, and I can grade one of these things in about 30 seconds. Reading, seeing, visual, they put comments on there. I'm teaching them to put Google Maps in here. Uh, they're using the define tool, they're using the research tool. I'm embedding some history content and some tech skills in with this too. Then, this happens. We go into Minecraft, and I'll kind of walk you through it as we press play. So that's an information block in Minecraft, EDU, and I can put directions there. Every scene begins with an information block so that the kids don't just start bouncing off of each other and colliding. And so they read what it is they're supposed to do, and then they just explore. There are border blocks around, so they, they, they can only keep them within a circle that I like. And they walk in and they see a priest. And the priest is cowering in the corner, and that's uh, Father Federick. And this is called Custom NPCs. It's a mod for Minecraft. And it allows you to put in dialogue, characters in the world. And so the kids can interact with these characters. You could have it go as deep as you want. You, you branch it out. Think of a tree, your dialogue. You have to think of the possible answers and where those answers would take them. These characters can also give your students items, if you'd like, like a book. Brother Michael will give them a book here at the end of this. This is Cecily. She was an eyewitness. Now, Mr. Walton didn't write about her. I put her into the story to get a, a citizen's point of view of what the Vikings did as they left her village. And she sends them on hints, sort of a quest, to find the Vikings. And the students got all excited because they thought, we're gonna go get the Vikings, and we're gonna go uh, fight them, and all this, and it didn't turn out that way. As they continue on through this village, they go on down now to a boatman who promises to take them down the river to where the Vikings were. And what you'll see when they click on the boatman, he's gonna ask them a question. You say yes, and they're teleported to the next scene. 
And so the kids have read this scene, and there's some more information for them. And yeah, they didn't really... Now they're surrounded by him. But they did find Brother Michael and with some other people over here. And there's, there's the Vikings around. Those are also non-player characters. They don't do anything, but they look menacing. If Minecraft players can look menacing. And there's Brother Michael. And as you're going to see, he's going to give the kids, he has a premonition that he's not going to be able to make, he's not going to survive the trip back to Scandinavia. So he gives them the holy relic, which is the uh, Gospel of St. John from uh, St. Cuthbert's, Cuthbert's Gospel of St. John. So the kids now have this, and they're going to progress through the Dark Ages. Here we go. I put, I put Ragnar in there too, and some of the kids had seen Vikings before, and they like jumped out of their seats because they saw Ragnar in there. Uh, and now they're going to be teleported here to the next scene. They wouldn't go through it this fast. I went through it quickly so you could uh, have a chance to see the whole thing. And now they've been teleported to the Viking village. And this is another scene, and Mr. Walton wrote about this. That's in case they went there accidentally. They shouldn't have gone there, and they can teleport back. This scene takes them to a Viking hall where you'll see a bunch of other Vikings and you'll see some servants and they're going to continue learning about what it's like to be a slave. As you'll see, sorry, Brother Michael didn't make it. They tossed him overboard. Now these non-player characters can do an amazing amount of things and they don't even really have to be human. There's all kinds of characters you can put in there, from orcs to elves to flying things to dragons to whatever you'd like them to be. So if you've got, you know, let fantasy run wild because it could, whatever you could imagine, you could place in there. And there's our Viking Hall, and they will, and there's uh, Bertha. She is going to become a healer, right? And the kids are filling in this backstory. They're taking notes throughout this whole thing. So Bob has given them a nice vignette that gives them the overview, but they're diving in and digging much, much deeper with this. And I didn't build those great halls or anything. With Minecraft, there is a thing called schematics. They're available online for free. You just download them, and you just put them in a folder on your computer, and you use a command. You just do slash load schematic and slash paste, and you have a Viking hall in your world. Or you have uh, the Globe Theater, or you have an aircraft carrier. Whatever, the, whatever it is, somebody's probably already built it and shared it, and you can put those in yourself. All right, this is what's covered here, and what I'm incredibly proud of, it because my kids are doing things I've, I didn't, I hate to say it, but I didn't think they could do. And I hate saying that because they can. They were struggling to write a paragraph at the beginning of this uh, year, school year. And this is what they do with their writing. So they're doing the annotation exercise, but when they're taking notes, then we have a day or two and we write our story. I'm calling it chapters. It's a, I'm telling you guys are all writing a historical a book of historical fiction, your own novel. And the story is being told now in the third person, but we've gone on to the Middle Ages now, and now it's first person. They're in the story, and they've written themselves into this story. So they've created, this is an outline I give them, I, I heavily scaffold it, and I say, this is things I want, but they're solving, they're connecting the scenes and the vignettes to each other. And an extraordinary thing is happening, because these kids are using their imagination to create their own world. And it's based on my history content. And those are things we covered in just the Viking Age, Dark Ages. And I'm telling them by the end of this school year, in which they will, they're on track, every one of my kids who, as I say, could not write a paragraph that was good, uh, now they're going to have 30 or 40 pages of a historical novel that's seen through their eyes, history seen through their eyes and all because of that Minecraft. And I just, I, I'm so excited about it. 
Uh, could you apply it to science and math? Yeah, absolutely. You could use nonfiction here. If you don't have a, your own Robert Walton, uh, you could have your, your own stories in here. You could have Archimedes in here. You could have Newton. Think of a story that inspired you and break it down so that your kids can read it and develop it in Minecraft. And it, it's, it's working wonderfully. My final one here is a project that if, you, if you're at Fall Q, I, I briefly uh, talked about this project that I was just about to do. And now I want to show you about the results of it. And this is kind of the next phase, because there's a lot of us out there that are now using Minecraft and trying to figure out what we can do. We see it. It's exciting. Our kids are really excited about it. But what's the next step for us? And I think this is a potential huge next step, is let's connect. Let's collaborate with each other. All we need is a server that's online. Most of our servers are behind firewalls at our school district. Let's get brave enough to get a server online and connect our kids. If I could connect with, with 40, 50 other seventh grade history teachers in California that want to invest some time in Minecraft, you know, we're going to change the world. And I think if we all thought that and moved into that mindset of a truly collaborative experience, we can develop worlds. So here is one of my first little baby steps at that. Uh, I'm teaching uh, medieval Japan, so I thought I want my guys to get poetry in their background. And medieval Japan, uh, out of medieval Japan comes a, a precursor to haiku called tonka poetry. Similar with its uh, design and structure. And so I contacted two people that I knew would be interested in potentially working on this. And one is Melvina there, Kurosuji. She's in Hawaii and she has fifth graders. And her fifth graders, uh, she teaches a Japanese culture class. And so her fifth grader, she's new to Minecraft, thought, let's demonstrate Japanese culture in Minecraft. So her goals for her students were to have her students recreate the seasons and put Japanese poetry. Because if you think about it, Hawaii doesn't really have seasons. And her kids haven't experienced seasons before. And in Japanese culture, seasons are very important. And they're poetic connection. So that was her goal. And then James, James York up here, he teaches, a, uh, he teaches in Japan, but he also teaches online. And he teaches an online course that's entirely in Minecraft. And you can learn Japanese in Minecraft by playing Minecraft. So he's developed a whole world that is Japanese oriented. So I asked James if he wouldn't mind if, I just first I said, I just like to go in with my kids and show them what Japan looks like and what you've done. Would you mind if, if we could do that? And he says, yeah, that would be great. I told him about the poems and he says, perfect, because give me the poems the kids wrote and we'll turn them into Japanese. I'll have my students who are learning Japanese convert them into Japanese. I said, oh, that's fantastic. So my kids' poems were converted into Japanese by his students. And we got to see his server. We got to visit his server and go around and, and see all the amazing things that he's done in his. And there's an example of a, uh, of a Tonka poem written in English, obviously not in Japanese. OK. Now, how do you do this in Minecraft, poetry in Minecraft? This is called a command block in Minecraft. And it's a special block. It's not there generally for everybody to use, you have to bring it up. Uh, there's a code you have to use to bring it up. But when you do, it's very powerful because that block will issue commands to the server to do things. And a command might be when you step right here, it changes from night to day. Or when you step over here, you might hear a sound. Or when you step over here, a monster might appear or a door will appear for you. So it's, it's issuing commands to the Minecraft server. And you don't need to know any much fancy code. I'll show you the code, all the code it is you need. One of the things it can do, though, is give players things. And that's how you get a, a command block in Minecraft. So if you're new to Minecraft, you have to be in creative mode and type in slash, forward slash, give, at P, means that's you, you're the player, 137. And 137 is the item number for a command block. And then you'll get a command block. And you can do these things. So I did something that most teachers advise me not to do, Minecraft using teachers. I gave my kids command blocks. 
I, want, I gave them all uh, seven command blocks, and I wanted them to write their poem. So they wrote a poem, and they wrote it as a, as a medieval Japanese citizen. And we studied you know, the social structure pyramid of J Japanese society. And they had to pick somebody and write a poem from that person's perspective. And Tonka poems are, they have nature in them, but they're also about emotions, strong emotions. So I thought that would be a good connection for the kids. Uh, there's give, and there's another give at 50. Uh, weather, slash weather, thunder, 10, means it's gonna thunder for 10 seconds. So I'm showing the kids some of the th cool things that they could do with it if they wanted to work that into their poem. And they did. We got a lot of thunder, we got a lot of rain, you get some lightning, uh, you get some change in scenery. And you can play sounds. In this case, play the sound of at the player, so only the player hears it, not everybody in the game. A harp note. You could have them play a whole musical number if you'd like. Now, here is the poem. So, slash tell means that's going to tell that student when they step on the block, it's going to give them that line. Now, that's cool enough, but I wanted my kids to not only write the poem and then code the poem, I wanted them to build the poem in Minecraft. And I wanted them to do it with natural resources. Rather than building buildings and structures, you know, Japanese culture is very tied in to nature. And I'm, I love Japanese gardening, so I thought, let's connect with that. So they've created, then, a world that you walk through and you experience the poem that way, all through the issues of these commands. So all this is hidden. Nobody sees that. But when you step, then, on one of the student's blocks, You'll see rooted to the ground, and then the next line as you go a little further down the path, you'll see the next line of the poem, and a little further down the path, the next line, and the next line, and then finally the end of it. So you're making your way through a world that the kids designed and manipulated. They did the landscaping for this. They didn't want a lot of structures that's designed exactly for a peasant or a, a fisherman, a farmer, a shogun, a samurai. Uh, they have got to pick who they wanted to write their poem for. And then, Minecraft is, we don't think of it as a, a vehicle for imagery like this, because it's big and blocky, and it, it doesn't seem like it would be beautiful, but it can be very, very beautiful. Every scene in Minecraft, every world in Minecraft is generated when you start it up. It's unique. It's never going to be generated again like that. So you don't really know what you're going to experience. And many of it fits that Japanese theme. So the kids wandered around and found some areas in which they could build their home. And then they worked very independently and structured, uh, designed, dug, placed blocks, but it was all kind of a natural setting. I said, we don't want you to, anybody to step here and think that you built some big, huge structure. It was just a wandering path. Very inspiring landscapes in Minecraft. And this is uh, one of my students' poems. What we, and at the end of this, I should preface this, the end of the unit, uh, all the poems were mapped out all over the world, and I connected them. So the kids spawned into one place. It was a little Japanese kind of a tea house, and they could walk outside, and they could step on any of these pressure plates and be teleported to another student's poem, and then come back and check it out. And so they did a reflective piece on that afterwards. Whose poems did they like, and what touched them the most about their poetry? And this one is by Cindy. Sun shining from skies. Her peasant feet touching sand. And you can see below there, that's where it shows the text.
water moves slowly. Calmness as it moves with fish. You have the sound of running water there. Nature, bright green everywhere. And now at the end, she ends it beautifully. You get a flower. So she gives you a flower at the end of this poem. And that's with a, uh, it looks different than regular Minecraft because you can put things called either texture packs or resource packs. So if you don't like the look of the blocks in Minecraft, there's free uh, downloads of different textures for each block. And that's a texture pack that is very Asian, Japanese kind of looking. So I added that. I used a different texture pack for the, the Viking village, and that had a more of a medieval effect. So you can customize your Minecraft worlds any way you would like to. Okay. Um, I've used for this Minecraft EDU, and uh, that's what many of us here, if you're a Minecraft EDU person, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity to get, bring Minecraft into your classroom because it's incredibly inexpensive and it's super powerful. It has teacher tools that we can use to control as much of our worlds as we want or as little of it. And it makes building things, running a server, maintaining it, uh, updating it very, very simple. It doesn't require a lot of technical skills at all. And the company that does, that makes Minecraft EDU is called Teacher Gaming. And that's perfect timing because they're coming to California to give like free workshops to teachers, three hour workshops. And they would love to come to your school or your school district, district office, and if you invite them, and if their dates are open, and have, okay, <laughs> get their dates, it's like I work for them, but I, I really don't work for them. Uh, they would love to come and share Minecraft EDU. They also do some other programs, a, a STEM kind of a program, STEM camp. So three hours of free Minecraft training if you're interested. And there's the info at tour.teachergaming.com. And there's the email. So if you wanted to connect with them and potentially have them come to your school, go for it. They'll be here from April, mid-April to mid-May is the time period. And uh, it's, it's a, a great opportunity. Uh, and that concludes. Thank you very much for coming and listening to Minecraft.